The evolution and devolution of My Hero Academia's animation throughout the years is fascinating. The show is home to some of the best cuts of animation, period, and it was a well-organized project for a while. That's obviously not the case anymore. Let's talk about My Hero Academia's animation. Make sure to subscribe. So, as all of you know, Bones is the studio behind My Hero Academia, but there's more to it. Like most major studios, Bones isn't a single entity. It has multiple sub-studios, namely A, B, C, D, and E. Very creative. My Hero Academia has, for most of its runtime, been a Studio C project. However, the keyword there is most. MHA started off as a Studio A project and ran into its fair share of production issues like most shows do. Season 1, unlike its sequels, was a one-core show. The team in charge had just finished working on the second season of Noragami and a 24-episode season wasn't viable. The show was, and still is to a degree, directed by Kenji Nagasaki, and the most prominent name involved with the project was character designer and industry legend Yoshihiko Umakoshi. Yutaka Nakamura wasn't involved at the time. Umakoshi's designs and supervision carried the static parts of the show, of which there were a lot. The designs were unique. From the harsh line art to the large eyes and the stylized facial anatomy, they looked amazing, especially so when they were corrected by Yomakoshi. My Hero Academia doesn't go for that modern webgen look. It tries to maintain design consistency. The show isn't a Sakuga haven either. The amount of movement is nowhere near the likes of, say, a Jujutsu Kaisen. This is why the designs are so important. A still frame works when the drawing is fun to look at. Of course, the show does move. It has plenty of what we call Sakuga. Season 1 had two major highlights, one of which was Kazuhiro Miwa's contribution. He did a lot of work on season 1, animating some incredible scenes and doing so extremely quickly. Miwa hasn't worked on MHA since season 1 by the way. He moved on to other stuff, most notably Fire Force. The other highlight was very interesting. Episode 2 featured four animators, who at the time were considered young talent, hot of One Punch Man. These animators were Takumi Sunakohara, Naoki Miyajima, Itsuki Tsuchigami, and of course, Hakyu Go. Sounds familiar? It should. These four names alongside Kazuto Arai, Hironori Tanaka, Toshi Sada, and more created the first Hakuyu Go episode, aka My Hero Academia episode 12. This same core team would go on to create some of the most outrageous visual spectacles ever, including Fate Apocrypha episode 22, Mob Psycho season 2 episodes 5 and 11, and season 3 episode 8, as well as the more recent Jujutsu Kaisen season 2 episodes 16 and 17. The Endeavor fight from episode 12 was an incredibly ambitious undertaking. This show simply didn't move for such a long period of time prior to this. The fight was directed and storyboarded by Hakuyu Go, and the sheer amount of energy packed into it was unreal. Every strike felt heavy, it was genuine chaos, and it kept building up. This was easily the highlight of the season. My Hero Academia Season 1 was a compact show. It did have its issues but its unique aesthetic and the cathartic finale made up for it. Season 2, however, was a different story. It was 25 episodes long instead of 13, and it had plenty of changes. The TV network changed, the substudio in charge changed from A to C, the schedule changed from rough to good, and the staff list changed from one that didn't have Yutaka Nakamura to one that did. Season 2 was a smooth production up until the last few episodes. I didn't keep up with anime back then, so I'm going off of the Sakuga blog articles published at the time. Season 2 had more highlights animation-wise, and on average, moved more. Yutaka Nakamura made his first appearance in episode 2. His drawings were utterly flawless and the motion was incredible, because again, it is Yutaka Nakamura, one of if not the greatest 2D animator of all time. He showed up again on episode 10, animating one of my all-time favorite sequences, one which made his work on episode 2 feel tame. The flow, the energy, the long impact frame sequences, it was godlike. Nakamura is known to rework the storyboards, framing scenes
scenes in his own way, this is a privilege awarded to the very best. His sense of timing, staging, and use of smears and impact frames are legendary. Another aspect of his skill set, one often overlooked by casual fans, is his grasp over the basics of animation and his drawing quality. His drawings will look amazing, even if they show up for 1 24th of a second. CAD Yoshihiko Umakoshi was heavily involved as well, and as always, his corrections looked incredible. Here's the thing, you can't entirely depend on highlight animators like Yutaka Nakamura. They will animate some incredible stuff, but only do so once or twice a season. You need talent that can produce good-looking scenes consistently, and season 2 had that. Names like Takafumi Mitani, Kosuke Kato, Naoto Uchida and more were present throughout the show, animating several scenes. Them, accompanied by the likes of Norimitsu Suzuki and Yuki Hayashi, made for a great two-core project. Season 3 was solid overall, but it was starting to show a few cracks. Cracks that would widen in the future. Remember Umakoshi? Well, this is what he did for Season 1, this is what he did for Season 2, and this is what he did for Season 3. That's less. Why? Because of this. A My Hero Academia movie, the first of many. These movies tend to handicap the adjacent season, as you'll see. The first movie had a relatively small key animator list, and as such, didn't have much of an impact on the TV anime. Season 3 was organized. Behind the scenes, it relied a lot less on outsourcing compared to its predecessors. Koki Fujimoto, an animator who had shown up once before, was now an important part of the project. He, alongside Takafumi Mitani, churned out amazing scenes even for the low-priority episodes. More about Fujimoto later. There was another issue, a more subjective one. The aesthetic was getting old. While it was a highlight early on, looking at the same designs and style for three seasons in a row with very little variety was a bit annoying. Also, the direction wasn't doing it for me. Despite being well animated, scenes looked boring. Maybe because the aforementioned novelty was starting to wear off, or perhaps it was because they were too one-to-one -one with the manga. I don't know, I haven't read it. These were minor issues at the time, but they would compound from that point on. Regardless, the season was solid. Nakamura animated the best-looking scenes as per usual, and things went well. Season 4 rolled around, and the cracks widened. Umakoshi did very little, and director Kenji Nagasaki took on the role of a super Supervisor. Both opted to focus more on the second movie, which was produced alongside the anime. Remember Takafumi Mitani? Well, he showed up once on season 4, and he did a lot of work on the second movie. These two things might be related. The amount of animation per episode went down as well, with multiple episodes having no real movement. The aesthetic continued to get old, and the direction felt less ambitious than ever before. It wasn't all bad. There were a few highlight episodes. Naka Nakamura showed up thrice, and Koki Fujimoto continued to animate a plethora of good-looking scenes. You can probably see where this is going. Season 5 suffered, especially the second half. Koki Fujimoto and Takafumi Mitani were gone. Both moved on to Super Crooks, and then on to MAPA projects like Chainsaw Man and JJK. The third movie was extremely ambitious, and as a result, the anime struggled. Even Yutaka Nakamura could only show up once. There was that infamous Vincent Chansard layout controversy, where his work was practically unused, most likely because the schedule was too tight, as alluded to by Chansard himself. I wasn't fond of the directorial choices either. The unimpressive scene compositions, that same art direction, that annoying blue sky, it wasn't good. Oh, but it makes sense for the sky to be blue shut up. Playing around with the environment to match the mood is anime 101. Season 6 was an improvement, understandably so, as they didn't release a movie alongside it, freeing up names like Norimitsu Suzuki, who did a massive amount of work. The second half did struggle, because again, yearly two core productions are complicated. Even Yutaka Nakamura's scene was compromised, but it definitely was an improvement. They played around with fully CGI shots, and a part of the story took place during the night, so they couldn't spam that godforsaken blue sky all over the place. And that brings us to the present day. Season 7 is set to air in May, quickly followed by the fourth movie. Will this be a repeat of season 5? Probably. Will they do something different? Probably.
Probably not. That's the sad state of affairs. The show looks unique compared to other stuff, but internally, it's homogenized. And it's getting old in my opinion. The team does deserve a lot of praise for maintaining a base level of quality for over 100 episodes. That's an extremely rare thing. Hoping for the best. That's about it. Liked the video? Check out this other bit of content on screen. Like and subscribe. And until next time.